I'm Pastor John. Uh -huh. I'm Pastor John Baird, and I want to welcome you to The Way, The Word. And we're going to be continuing in our study of the book of 1 Peter. And we're going to be in 1 Peter, chapter 5, the first seven verses. Hey, the reason for those donkey sounds is because of the title of today's message. The title of today's message is, Jesus is the King and we are the donkey. Now, many of you may remember Corey Ten Boom. She's that famous Nazi Holocaust survivor, and she wrote that famous book called The Hiding Place one of the more popular books in recent history. And in her life, the Lord really used her in remarkable ways. She traveled the world and shared her story with many people. She talked about the many lessons that she had learned during those years in the Nazi concentration camp. She talked about how the Lord had brought her through. A reporter once asked her, is it hard for you now that you're so popular and famous? Is it hard for you to remain humble? Corey Ten Boom's answer was classic. Here's what she said. She said, you know, when Jesus rode into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday on the back of a donkey, everyone was waving olive branches and worshiping him. They were singing his praises and throwing their garments on the ground in front of the donkey. Do you think for one moment it ever entered the mind of the donkey that all those praises were for him? I just love that, man. She went on to say, look, if I can just be a donkey on which Jesus rides in his glory, then you know what? I give him all the praise and glory in my life as well. What a great reminder to us of how important it is that we remain humble. You see, as we look in Scripture, we discover that as it pertains to our lives being filled by God and used by God, whether it's in the ministry or our families or our jobs, no matter where we're at, we must remember He is the King and we are the donkey. He is the one that has empowered us. He is the one that fills us by His grace. He fills us with His Holy Spirit and then uses us for his glory. And when God uses us, it's not because we're so great or we're so holy. He uses us because it's his strength in us that is the hope of glory. Again, we are the donkey and Jesus is the king. And you guys know me. I don't just preach to you or the choir. All of us need to be reminded of this. Because again, I think it's so easy in our flawed and sinful condition to begin to take credit for those things that God is doing in us and through us. Uh, for example, we can become proud. Maybe it's our position in a big company or our position in church leadership. Maybe our position in the community and people look up to us. Maybe you're in a position where people have to follow your lead. And it's so easy in that to start thinking of ourselves as self self-reliant, you know, self-dependent. And so it's easy for us to think, hey, it's my energy or my resources or my hard work. We can also become proud because of possessions. Maybe God has blessed you with some material things, and sometimes we can begin to take credit for having acquired those things. But what we really need to see is that God has blessed us with those things, and he has made us stewards over those things. God has given us those gifts so that we can help others and serve others so that the kingdom of God may prosper. There are all kinds of things in which we can become proud and arrogant, and in our hearts, we need to be careful of that. We really need to be on guard against that. Some people are proud because of their accomplishments, whether it's letters after their names or titles before their names or things that they've done in their lives, you know, the high points. And so often we can focus on those things and we're quick to let other people know who we are. There's this famous story about Muhammad Ali. He was on an airplane and the flight attendant told him to buckle his seatbelt. Muhammad Ali told the flight attendant, Superman don't need no seatbelt. The flight attendant told Muhammad Ali, hey, Superman don't need no airplane either. It's the same for you and I today. 
Sometimes we just need to be put in our place. Actually, the word humility means, it literally means, to know your place. And in our text this morning, we find Peter reminding us just what our place is and what our place isn't. Like a gardener, Peter comes to the soil of our hearts and he begins to root out, if you will, those areas and issues that are unpleasing to God. He also shows us areas in which we need to grow. And so Peter's exhortation to us this morning, it really is, hey, we are the donkey and Jesus is the king. Check it out as Peter begins in verse 1. To the elders among you, I appeal as a fellow elder and a witness of Christ's suffering, who also will share in the glory to be revealed. Be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, watching over them, not because you must, but because you are willing, as God wants you to be, not pursuing dishonest gain, but eager to serve, not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. It's interesting that in a chapter that deals with humility, the very first group of people that Peter addresses are those in leadership, specifically and in context, people who are in church leadership. He starts the chapter out in verse 1 by saying, To those elders who are among you, I exhort you. The word elder is synonymous with the word pastor. Elder, pastor, the word means the same thing in this book. And essentially, an elder or a pastor is one who oversees the spiritual climate of the church. And so Peter addresses the spiritual leaders here. He's encouraging the spiritual leaders to have humility. Even though the first group of people that Peter addresses here in these verses are spiritual leaders, the leadership principles set forth in these verses are so profound and timeless that they're applicable in virtually any leadership setting, whether it's in your home, at your job, or your private business. Again, these verses are so relevant, timeless, and profound that they're really applicable to all of us. And so the first thing that Peter reminds us of is that as leaders, we need to have a humble mindset. And so when it comes to areas that we all need to grow in, number one, we all need to have a humble mindset. In verse 1, Peter says, I exhort you as a fellow elder and as a partaker in the glory that shall be revealed. Notice how Peter refers to himself. He doesn't say, I exhort you as Pope Peter the first, or I exhort you as the most holy reverend Pastor Peter. No, he says, I exhort you as a fellow elder. In other words, he says, look, I'm just part of the team. I'm part of the body of Christ. I'm just one of you. And these are some of the things that the Lord has taught me. And this is Peter's M.O. Because the old Peter, he was all about position and notoriety. The old Peter, he was all about titles. But after going through seasons of brokenness and Jesus teaching him humility, Peter now says, hey, I exhort you as a fellow elder. And it's so important that we see that as leaders, we need to have a humble mindset. The apostle Paul put it this way in the book of Romans chapter 12, verse 3. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought. In other words, we are just part of the team. We're part of the body of Christ, and we get to join God in his kingdom. We get to join God in his purpose, and both Peter and Paul are telling us today it's God that gives us the strength to do what we do. They're both telling us, hey, you shouldn't be too quick to put yourself on a pedestal. We shouldn't be too quick to think of ourselves better than what we really are. The true account is told of Christian Herder, the one-time governor of Massachusetts. He was out one time campaigning, and he was trying to raise support, and he had a busy morning filled with speaking engagements. It gets to be about 7 o'clock in the evening, and he's at another speaking engagement. This time it's at a church, and he's absolutely exhausted. And it just so happens that at the end of this speaking engagement that this church is putting on a barbecue. And so he gets in line, he grabs his plate, 
plate and there's this lady giving out chicken to everyone. So she gives him a piece of chicken and he looks at her and he says, listen, I'm really sorry and I, I don't mean to bother you, but I'm so hungry. I've had such a busy day. Do you mind if I have two pieces of chicken? And she said, hey, I'm sorry, sir. Our policy is everybody gets one piece of chicken. That way everyone will get one. So he pulls out the big guns and he tells her, hey, look, do you know who I am? I'm the governor of this state and I would really like another piece of chicken. The lady looked at him and she said, well, do you know who I am? He said, no, who are you? And she said, I'm the lady in charge of the chicken. Now here's your piece of chicken. Move along, mister. And I love that story because it lets us know that just like Christian Herder, sometimes we Christians can be foul. <laughs> but we really can. Sometimes we mistreat people because we think, oh, well, I've got this position or I just got this promotion. But Peter is telling us here, hey, we're not as important as we think we are. And the moment that we start to think that we're indispensable, the moment that we start to think we're irreplaceable, the moment we start to think that no one can do what I can do, let me just say this to you. Look out. When I was a young man, I had a job in a factory. And I remember thinking, you know, this job really isn't such a good fit for me. I deserve to get paid more. And so I went in and told the boss how I was feeling. And right before I went in, I remember thinking secretly that I really hope that he says to me, you know what, John, please don't leave. We'll give you a raise, man. We'll give you whatever you want. And so I go in and I tell the boss, hey, you know what, boss? I'm thinking about moving on. And the boss said, okay, man, just go ahead and pick up your paycheck and be sure and clean out your locker. And I have to tell you, my pride just totally took a blow. And so I look at him and I go, boss, isn't it gonna be hard to replace me? And of everything that he could do, he just sat back in his chair and started to laugh. <laughs> he was drinking a glass of water at the time. And so he looks at me and he says, John, put your finger in my glass of water. So I did. And he said, now take your finger out. So I pulled my finger out and he said, how long did it take the water to replace where your finger was? Man, I got the point really quick. He was telling me, hey, go ahead and step out. Go ahead and leave because it's going to be really easy to fill back up the place you leave behind. That event really had an impact on me. And I think it's so important that we remember that we're not as important and as invaluable as we usually think that we are. There's always someone else who can so easily do what we can do. A few weeks ago, I had this wonderful opportunity to go downtown and meet with pastors from all around the Cincinnati area. It was really quite refreshing. And I was talking to this one pastor, and he said to me, you know, being a pastor, being in ministry, it's really like a shark's tooth in a lot of ways. There's always another tooth right behind it. And his point was, there's always someone else. And just when you begin to think you're so important, just when you begin to think that everything hinges around you, you discover that. No, the Lord can move, man. The Lord can take you out and the church will keep going on just as it has done all these centuries. And so Peter reminds us that we need to have this mindset of humility. I'm just a fellow elder, he says. I'm just part of the team. I'm not lording it over you. I'm not trying to say that I'm more important than you. And so just what is this humble mindset. Well, the humble mindset realizes that the gifts that we have and the positions that we have and the things that we get to do for God's glory, that those things are 110% a gift of God's grace. It has nothing to do with us. So therefore, the humble leader, the humble Christian says, okay, God, I'm giving you the glory. I'm going to worship you and praise you. I'm going to rely upon you because you are my source in everything. I am filled with a sense of wonder and thankfulness because you're letting me do the things that I'm doing. Do you want to walk in a humble mindset? Well, when you think of the humble mindset, what you have to do is you have to consider Jesus. Look what the Apostle Paul said in the book of Philippians chapter 2 verses 1 through 4. 
Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from His love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests interests of the others. And then he goes on to say in verses 5 through 8, in your relationships with one another have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. The humble mindset pursues after Jesus. It's all for you and by you, God. And so when it comes to areas that we all need to grow in, Peter says, number one, we need to have a humble mindset. And number two, we need to have a humble motivation. All we have to do is look again at verse 2, where Peter says, just don't do anything out of compulsion. Do it willingly. He says, don't do it for dishonest gain, but eagerly, not as being lords over those who are entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. Check it out. Peter is telling us that as leaders, as Christians, we need to check our hearts. What is our motive? Why are we in this position of leadership? Why are we ministering as Christians? Why are we doing what we're doing at our jobs and in our families? What is our motivation? What is our purpose in doing that? Is it for our own gain? Is it so that we can get ahead? Is it so that we can make a name for ourselves? Are you just using that company you work for? Or is our mindset one of humility? Is our motive one of humility? Hey, I'm in this to help others. I'm in this to serve others. And this is so challenging and applicable to all of us. And since I'm a pastor, of course, I'm going to put it in a Christian kind of a context. And I'm going to tell you right now that not everyone who serves in a church is there necessarily for all the right reasons. Not every leader who serves in the church is there for all the right reasons. That's not me giving my opinion. The scripture says that that's going to happen, and it really is a sad truth. Peter is telling us here that some people will use the ministry out of compulsion. They will use the ministry for dishonest gain. Maybe they like the recognition. Maybe they like the attention. Maybe they use that ministry as a platform for their own agenda. Maybe it's to advance themselves. Maybe it's to advance their family. Maybe it's to advance just their core group. He tells us that some would even use the ministry so that they could become well off financially. It's sad to say that we've seen many examples of this in our world today. Many in ministry, some TV preachers, or maybe it's just those well-known pastors from those really big churches, but many in the ministry today, they're not in it to serve the people. They're in it so that they can become well-known and get rich. Again, it's just one of those sad truths, but it's a truth we need to discern. It's a truth that we need to be aware of as stewards of God and as citizens of his kingdom. We must walk in forgiveness, but we must not allow ourselves to turn a blind eye to this. As Paul would say in the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 17, unlike so many, we do not peddle the word of God for profit. On the contrary, in Christ, we speak before God with sincerity as those sent from God. Jesus himself warned us against those kinds of leaders. He warned us against those kind of leaders who walked in spiritual authority, but used that spiritual authority for themselves. And he tackles this directly in the book of Matthew chapter 23, when he talks about the Pharisees. Man, if there was ever a group of people who struggled with this issue of pride, it was the Pharisees. They did everything that they did so that other people would look at them. They wanted everyone to think that they were so 
holy. For example, when a Pharisee gave money, made donations, when he helped out the poor, he had this little trumpet that he would carry around with him. And when the time came for him to give, he would whip out his little trumpet. He'd stand on the street corner and blow his trumpet. And all the people would say, oh, look, the Pharisee, he's blowing his trumpet. And then they would come closer. And when all the crowds had gathered around him, that Pharisee would reach into his pocket, grab some money, and he would give it to the poor people. And all those people that were standing around, they would say, wow, look how spiritual he is. Look at the wonderful thing he's doing. And it's actually there that we get the term blowing your own horn. This is what Jesus said about the Pharisees. Take heed that you do not do your charitable deeds before men to be seen by them. Otherwise, you have no reward from your Father in heaven. Therefore, when you do a charitable deed, do not sound a trumpet before you as the Pharisees do in the synagogues and in the streets that they may have glory from men. Jesus said, don't let your right hand see what your left hand is doing. Jesus said, if you're going to give, do it privately. According to William Barclay, the Talmud describes seven different types of Pharisees. Six of the seven are bad. The shoulder Pharisee who wore all his good deeds and righteousness on his shoulder for everyone to see. The wait a little Pharisee who always intended to do good deeds but could always find a reason for doing them later, not now. The bruised or bleeding Pharisee who was so holy that he would turn his head away from any woman seen in public and was therefore constantly bumping into things and tripping, thus injuring himself. The humpback Pharisee who was so humble that he walked bent over and barely lifted his feet so everyone could see just how humble he was. The always counting Pharisee who was always counting up his good deeds and believed that he put God in debt to him for all the good he had done. The fearful Pharisee who did good because he was terrified that God would strike him with judgment if he didn't. And the God-fearing the Pharisee who really loved God and did good deeds to please the God he loved. Jesus pointed out to the people that everything the Pharisees did was for show. He told the people, don't be like the Pharisees. He also said, beware of those people who are in positions of leadership who are doing it for their own gain. Now, the reason that I camp on this here for a few minutes is because I really believe that we need to hold accountable those pastors or ministers or leaders or spiritual leaders, whatever you want to call them, those people that are teaching in those churches that you and I choose to link up with. And I think we really need to filter a question through this text right here. Are those pastors, those leaders, the spiritual leaders, are they in it for their own gain or are they in it to be a blessing to the body of Christ? How will I know that? How will I know which leaders to listen to, which leader is good to listen to? How will I know how to glean from them and who to glean from? How do I know who to learn from? Well, here's a good test. Check it out. Verse 2, Peter says, shepherd the flock of God. Here it is, the way that I can discern, the way that you can discern if it's a good ministry, a good teacher, a good pastor, a good minister. The question we need to ask is, are they shepherding the flock? What does it really mean to shepherd? Well, scripturally, it means to feed the flock of God. Is that shepherd, that pastor, that leader feeding the flock, or is he or she feeding themselves? Are they feeding their own? So where do we see this? Where do we see Jesus talking about this? Well, in the Gospel of John, chapter 21, Jesus told Peter, feed my sheep. So when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him again a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. And so how is the flock of God fed? 
Well, they're fed through the word of God. One way that I can tell, one way that I can discern, hey, is this a good teacher? Is this a church that I should link up with? Well, I just ask myself the question, are they teaching the word of God? And I'm not just talking about throwing a verse in here or there. Anyone can quote scripture out of context and use it for their own gain. A person can take scripture out of context and really make it say whatever they want it to say, again, for their own gain. There would be no other reason why someone would do that. You can take the Bible and preach all kinds of heresy with it. And so understand, when I talk about feeding the flock here, I'm talking about faithfully diligently, systematically going through the Word of God, plunging into the Scriptures, knowing what the Word of God has to say. And if that ministry, if that teacher, if that pastor is doing that, teaching the Word of God and equipping the saints for the work of the ministry, well then that's a pretty good indication of what Peter is saying here. It's a pretty good indicator that that pastor, that leader, not only is teaching the Word of God, but that they are following the Word of God. And listen, the flock, they have a responsibility in this too. All Christians are called to grow in Jesus's image. The scripture calls for all Christians to not just partake of the milk of God's Word and remain spiritual babies who always depend on someone else to feed them, but to grow, to be able to partake of the meat of God's Word and grow. Just as we grow in the physical, we learn to feed ourselves. But even though we can feed ourselves spiritually, that never negates the responsibility of the shepherd, the church leader, to feed the flock. But if that church leader's whole thing is not feeding the flock, but yet fleecing the flock, well then you know what? You need to be careful. Remember, God is watching you too. He's saying, hey, what kind of steward are you? Do you really know what's going on inside of the church you attend? And if you know things are happening that aren't right, why are you there? And Peter is telling us today in these verses, hey, it's out there. They're out there. There are ministers and pastors and leaderships, family leaderships. They're all out there, man. And they are fleecing the flock. And one of the ways that you can tell a church like this or a church leader who's like this is they're always talking about money. Their whole idea of ministry is to gain. It's to accomplish their own goals and their own purposes rather than like Peter in our verses today. Hey, I'm just part of the team. We're all part of the body of Christ and we're all here for the furtherance of God's kingdom. We want to equip you to use your gifts and your talents for the glory of God. And one of the reasons that this touches my heart is because I have a burden for the body of Christ. Christ for the people of God. And as a pastor, I'm constantly praying, God, help me be a pastor that feeds the flock, who's there for the flock, not just spiritually and emotionally through my prayers, but physically there for them when they need me. And one of the reasons that I share this with you here today is because maybe the closest that you get to church is watching this little cable TV show that I do right here. And maybe it's come to a point now where you say, hey, I'm tired of Pastor John and all his corny jokes, man. I'm moving on. I'm going to go ahead and find something else. And if that's the case, well, I want you to remember what Peter is saying here in these verses today, what God is telling us through Peter in these verses today. Wherever you go, make sure that it's a place that teaches God's word, a place where you're allowed to use your gifts, where you get to take part in serving others. Beware of those places that are there to fleece you and use you and to gain financially from you. And understand my heart here. It's good to spend time with other believers. If you're not a member of a church, find a good church or maybe a good small group and join in and be part of the fun of all that. Be part of the body of Christ. And once you do that, remember this. You can still watch the show, okay? <laughs> and so Peter tells us, hey, beware of those leaders, those churches that are in it for their own gain. And then in verses 5 and 6, he tells us, in the same way, you who are younger, submit yourself to your elders, all of you. Clothe yourselves with humility toward one another, because God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. And so Peter 
After calling spiritual leaders on the carpet, he then invites everyone to join on the very same carpet. Uh Uh-oh. He says, okay, this doesn't just apply to spiritual leaders or just to pastors or those who are in church leadership. He says this applies to all of us. He tells us we need to be submissive one unto the other. And then he says, be clothed with humility. I love that phrase, be clothed with humility. I did some research on that phrase, and what I found just blew me away. Check this out. Be clothed with humility. Do you know what it literally means in the Greek language? It means to be wrapped in the clothing of a slave. Question, where else did Peter see a spiritual leader wrapping himself in the clothing of a slave? Anyone? Well, the Last Supper, of course, in the Gospel of John, chapter 13, verse 4, it says that Jesus got up after supper. He took off his outer clothes and wrapped himself in a towel. Why a towel? Because a towel was what the slaves in the ancient world wore. Back in the old days when Peter was alive and Jesus was ministering, when you went into someone's home, the tradition was that they would have a slave there who would come and wash your feet. The reason for this was that in the old days, they all wore sandals and your feet would get extremely dirty from walking on those old dusty, rocky roads. It was actually considered to be the lowest form of servanthood. And there in John chapter 13, we find Jesus wrapping a towel around himself, again, the clothing of a slave. He gets a basin of water and then one by one, he washes his disciples' feet. And when he was done, he told them in verses 12 through 17, Look, I have done this as an example for you. If I have done this for you, and you consider me to be not only your rabbi, your teacher, but your Lord and God, then you now need to go and wash the feet of each other and others. My brothers and sisters, all of you believers who are watching the show today, Understand, this is exactly what God calls us to do. We're called to look for opportunities to serve other people, to minister to other people, not only with our words, but really more with our actions. We're called to go out of our way for the sake of others. To have this humble mindset and motivation means that we are washers of feet. Is there someone in your life whose feet you can wash? Maybe a family member, a friend, or a co-worker. Is God putting someone on your heart today? Someone he wants you to serve so that they can see him through your actions. Peter says, everything we do needs to be filtered through this humble attitude. Why? Why does Peter tell us that this humble attitude is so important? Here's why. Verse 6, because God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. Man, how true is that verse? It is so true. And haven't we seen it as we've walked through life? God really does resist the proud. History is filled with the legacies of people who have shook their fist in the face of God, too proud to bow their knee before God. And as a byproduct of that, they were humbled by God. Whether it be Pharaoh, who said, I refuse to let God's people go free. God humbled him through a series of plagues. Or Nebuchadnezzar, who was so proud that day as he looked over his mighty Babylonian empire and said, all of this kingdom is because of my hands. What ended up happening to him? The book of Daniel tells us that he went insane for seven years. He literally thought he was a cow. Literally, man, he had a cow. He was eating grass like a cow. God humbled him in a very dramatic way. Or Herod in the New Testament, in the book of Acts, it says that as he spoke, people chanted, the voice of God and not that of a man. It says that Herod began to believe what they chanted. He began to proclaim himself to be a god. He wore very bright garments so that the sun would shine on them and it would look like he was glowing. What happened to him? The book of Acts tells us that worms ate him and he died. History is filled with the stories of proud men and proud women who were humbled by God. They were either humbled or they ended up like Herod. 
Recently, I was at a book sale and I picked up a book by Friedrich Nietzsche. Now understand, I don't recommend that people read anything by Friedrich Nietzsche, but sometimes I get intrigued as to why people like Friedrich Nietzsche think the way that they do. And if you know anything about Nietzsche, you know he was a very proud and arrogant man. And just so you don't think that I'm saying that because he and I have different views, his contemporaries also viewed him in that light. And so I opened up this book. It's called Echo Homo, How One Becomes What One Is. And these are the names of some of the chapters. Check this out. Chapter 1, why I am so clever. Chapter two, why I am so wise. Chapter three, why I write such good books. Chapter 14 was called Why I Am Destiny. That pretty much describes Frederick Nietzsche. He was a man who was arrogant. He was an atheist, by the way. Frederick Nietzsche was the guy who said, God is dead. And what happened to Frederick Nietzsche? In 1889, while walking the streets of Turin in Europe, history tells us that in a moment, suddenly, unexpectedly, Friedrich Nietzsche lost his mind. He went insane, and he spent the rest of his years in a mental institution. God humbles the proud and resists the arrogant. And I saw a bumper sticker recently that I absolutely love that goes right along with what we're talking about here. At the top was the original saying by Nietzsche. It said, God is dead by Nietzsche, 1883. And underneath it said, Nietzsche is dead, God, 1900. Peter is telling us we need to be humble. We need to be broken because if we're not broken, if brokenness is not part of the rhythm and the cadence of our lives, well then God will have to break us. And Peter is telling us in these verses today that God will humble us. And he's telling us that it's so vital for us to get this because this issue of pride is something that we can't just allow to go unconfessed and unrepented for. It has to be dealt with in our heart. It needs to be dealt with swiftly and radically. It only comes through brokenness, whether by our own choice or instituted by God. While I was studying our verses for today, I did what I usually do on a nice day. I took this old lawn chair that I like, and I went way out in my backyard near the woods. I've got a woods in my backyard. And so I'm sitting out there contemplating these verses, and all of a sudden I felt something funny. And I looked down, and there is this snake slithering across my shoe. And I want you to know, I released my inner ninja, you know, and I jumped up out of that chair and I was like, whoa, and I kicked that snake right off of my shoe. And so I was kind of freaked out about the whole thing. And so I start to look for that snake, like, where did he land? And I look over and I see him about four feet away, only instead of crawling away from me, that snake is crawling directly at me. So I move over about eight, nine feet the other way, the snake changes directions and comes at me again. So this is what I did. I ran and I got a pair of gloves and I got this bushel basket thing and I just put that bushel basket over that snake and then I took a stick and I got him up in that bushel basket and I took him out in the woods and I let that snake go. It was a battle, the battle was on, but that snake lost. And I think I couldn't help but think how sometimes God has to remind us that we're fallible, that we're fallen, that we're sinful. And I think that that snake came just to remind me of that fact, just to remind me of how it can go down if I let my arrogance and my pride swell up inside of me. It's at that time, those kind of times, that God is going to have to catch me off guard and do something, do some reminding in a way that I might not like. <laughs> I mean, check it out. When I saw that snake, was I like, oh, okay, Mr. Snake, I didn't see you there. No worries. Feel free to slither on across my foot. Maybe right up my pants leg if you want to. No, I got rid of that thing in a dramatic way because it bothered me. I don't know a lot about snakes. For all I knew, that snake could have been poisonous. But either way it went, whether it was poison or not, I knew I didn't want it to bite me. And really, Peter is kind of saying to us in our verses today, hey, this is how you deal with that snake. This is the prescription for pride. And 
then he says, are you ready? Here it is. Check it out. Our last verse for today, verse 7, and we're going to close with this. Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7, cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. In the context of our verses today, dealing with pride, the need for brokenness, this, Peter says, is the prescription. You cast that care. You cast that snake. You get rid of that thing. You give it to the Lord. And how do you do that? Through prayer. The Lord really laid this on my heart as I was studying these verses. The truth is, if I'm not praying, then it's a pretty good indication that I have become proud. If as a pastor, I'm not constantly in prayer to God, praying, God, I need you to be the pastor through me. I need you to show me the right decisions to make. Lord, I need your strength so that you can teach through me. Lord, I need your wisdom in preparing the next message. If I'm not doing those things, it's a sign that I've become prideful and arrogant. It means I'm relying on my own resources. It's like I'm saying, hey, Lord, I don't need to pray because I can do this on my own. And the moment that I drift from prayer, well, that's the moment pride begins to choke out the joy and the fruit in the heart of my ministry. Hey, pride and joy don't mix. (laughs) Really? That's better. But listen, it's the same for every believer watching today. If you want to know if pride and arrogance are creeping into your life, take a good look at your prayer life. It's impossible to be arrogant and at the same time be on your knees. It's when we come before the Lord and we realize just who He is, His glory, His grace, His grandeur. It's then that we fix our eyes upon Jesus and his sacrifice. And we realize, first of all, our inadequacy and our inability. And secondly, that it's his sufficiency and his strength that can flow through us. Just ask Isaiah. If you look in the book of Isaiah, the first five chapters, you see a man who initially, at least, seems to be relying on his own resources. The first five chapters, it's nothing but judgment. Woe unto you, and woe unto you, and woe unto you. It's a chapter that's just filled with woes. You would think that Isaiah was riding a horse or something. There's so many woes. But then, In Isaiah chapter 6, Isaiah prays. He comes before the Lord because he had a vision of the Lord. And he says, I saw the Lord high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple with glory. And the angels were crying, Holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And Isaiah's response to this vision is totally the opposite of the things he was saying in the first five chapters. Now Isaiah says, is this, woe unto me. He calls himself undone. He says, I am a man of unclean lips. Isaiah was broken before God. He was broken in the presence of the Lord. And it's the same for us when we take the time to get on our knees and confess our sin. Confession in the Bible means to be in agreement with God. That means that we're in agreement with God that what we've done is sinful, that it's unpleasing to God. Arrogance and pride, those things are unpleasing to God. They are sinful in the eyes of God. God calls us to a walk of humility, and he tells us in our verses today, hey, it's not so hard to do. God says, just cast your cares upon me. Don't try to carry the weight of the world on your shoulders because you're just going to get stressed out. You're just going to get prideful and arrogant. You and I, we must learn to be dependent on the Lord. Jesus said, come to me, all you who are weary, who are burdened, and I will give you rest. Jesus says, hey, come learn from me because I am humble. Jesus says, it's then that you're going to find the rest you need for your soul. As a young man, a carpenter from Nazareth who was at the same time God Almighty, Jesus would turn the other cheek. Jesus would minister to the least and the lonely. Jesus spent time with a broken prostitute. It was Jesus who would touch a leper. It was Jesus who would wash the feet 
of his disciples. That means he washed even the feet of Judas, the one he knew would betray him. Jesus, the one who knew no sin, became sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God. My friends, it's not until someone comes to Jesus that they can really learn what humility really is. It's not until someone comes to Jesus that they can see what humility really looks like. And when they come, they're not going to find judgment. They're not going to find fingers pointed in their face. No, they're going to find God's grace and mercy because God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. And so until the next time you and I meet here on the way of the word, may God bless you, may God keep you, and may God grant you the desires of your heart. Until then, see you later everybody.